Good afternoon. I'm Arun Serafin, Deputy Director of the Emerging Technologies Institute at the National Defense Industrial Association. Thank you to all the attendees for your support of NDIA and ETI, and thank you for joining us today for today's webinar, Quantum Computing 101 with Dr. Charlotte Hinkle of the Government Accountability Office. This webinar is part of our Tech Thursday series, where we'll be distilling complex technologies into introductory webinars on the science and defense implications. We've all heard about the potential that quantum computing has to shape both our economy and our national security. This webinar will help explain where we are, take a look at the hype versus the reality, and delve into the science, what makes these quantum computers different from traditional computers, including talking about the basic science and the quantum phenomena that make these quantum computers a potentially powerful technology, as well as exploring potential applications of these computers to national security. So some administrative remarks before we get started. Uh, first, all attendee lines are muted. If you have a question during the webinar, you can submit your question in the question box in the webinar panel on the right side of your screen. We'll do our best to get through all the questions during the Q&A. We are recording today's webinar for members unable to attend and for any member who wishes to review the material at a later date. And last, within the next few days, we'll post the recording, the slides, and the answers to the Q&A on NDIA Connect for your review. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Charlotte Hinkle. Uh, Dr. Hinkle is a senior physical scientist in the science technology Ass assessments and analytics team at the US Government Accountability Office, GAO, which provides Congress, executive agencies, and the public with timely fact-based nonpartisan information. Prior to serving as a senior physical scientist, Charlotte was a senior analyst with GAO's Natu Natural Resources and Environment Team. She was a congressional fellow and a postdoctoral researcher at New York University. Dr. Hinkle has a PhD in physical chemistry from Ohio State University, or the Ohio State University, and a BS in chemistry from the University of Virginia. Thanks for being with us today, uh, Dr. Hinkle, and over to you. Thanks, Arun, and uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for having me today to give this Technology 101 on quantum computing status and prospects. As Arun said, I'm Charlotte Hinkle, and I am a senior physical science with, scientist with GAO's Science Technology Assessment and Analytics team. So today, really, before getting into the Quantum 101, I'll give a little background on GAO and, tech, and the technology assessments. Then after that, I'll launch into that Quantum 101, followed by some information on quantum computing applications, and then industry and federal players. So to start with just a brief overview of GAO, and GAO provides fact-based nonpartisan information to Congress, and it provides information that can be used to save taxpayers billions of dollars. For every dollar spent in GAO over the last five years, uh, taxpayers have received an average return of investment of approximately $158 for every single dollar. In, in 2021, GAO celebrated its 100th anniversary. While GAO's work is primarily conducted through con congressional mandates or requests, there are certain topics such as the information that we've gathered on quantum computing that will be discussed today that are conducted under the authority of the Comptroller General. And this is usually done for topics that are of wide congressional interest. So to start with, I'll discuss a little about what the Science Technology Assessment and Analytics Team, or STAA, does. STAA is GAO's newest team, and our work focuses on science and technology, and we really maintain four areas of work. These technology assessments, science and technology program auditing, engineering sciences, and our innovation lab. So technology assessments provide foresight on technologies and have been conducted on quantum such as techno quantum technologies, which we'll be discussing today, position navigation and timing, and blockchain. And as a part of the technology assessment portfolio, we also develop spotlights. And those are two-page high-level overviews of topics such as things like non-fungible tokens or blockchain. And these are really done as really high level documents just to give people that high level picture. So the next area of work that we do is science and technology program auditing. And this is more of GAO's traditional audit work and conducts performance audits on topics such as the SBIR and STTR programs or the federal research ecosystem. 
Our third area of work relates to engineering sciences, and this work supports teams across GAO and provides them with cost and schedule estimates in order to support their ongoing audit work. So the fourth area of work that we do is our audit innovation lab. And this is focused on advanced analytics and emerging technologies and could revolutionize how GAO auditors and other government employees work. And additionally, STAA analysts and specialists provide support to teams across GAO. So now to get into a little of the Quantum 101. So quantum computers themselves take advantage of counterintuitive quantum physics properties that apply to the smallest particles of light and matter. And a particle in the quantum physics sense is in all possible observable states until it is observed. So quantum physics itself provides the basis for quantum computing and explores the behavior and interactions of these small particles. Some quantum physics properties like superposition and entanglement give a quantum computer its power, while other quantum physics properties like measurement and the no cloning theorem might provide more of a challenge for a quantum computer developer. So as I mentioned, superposition and entanglement are two of the quantum properties that give the quantum computer its power. And for superposition, it's a property that makes it to where an unobserved particles are simultaneously in all possible states until the particle is measured. And for entanglement, multiple particles can become quantum mechanically linked. And if the particles are linked, measuring one particle will reveal information about the other particles it is linked to, which can speed up calculations. For an ent and for entanglement, multiple particles can be two particles linked together, four particles linked together, it's really just multiple particles being linked together. However, there are properties that, as I mentioned, present more of a challenge for quantum computer developers. And these include measurement and the no cloning theorem. Measurement breaks the superposition, which is needed to calculate quantum information and fundamentally alters the particle, meaning that it is no longer in the same quantum state. And the no cloning theorem states that unknown quantum states cannot be copied. And this means that a particle must be measured in order to copy its information, which means that it is no longer in the same quantum state that it was before and is no longer in that same superposition. So, what, so now that we have talked a little about some of the underlying quantum physics properties, let's talk a little about quantum computers themselves. Quantum computers are a form of computing that was first proposed by Richard Feynman in the late 1950s. And it really took off in about 1994 when Peter Shor introduced Shor's algorithm. And Shor's algorithm can quickly factor large numbers like those used in RSA secure encryption. If a quantum computer is large enough, it is, factor, it is hypothesized to be able to factor these, the numbers that are used for RSA. So quantum computers right now, well, they're in their early days of development and are built on the study of the smallest particles to collect, generate, and process information. In doing so, they can process information in ways that a classical computer cannot. And as such, they could dramatically accelerate computation for certain applications, such as the factoring of large numbers that I just discussed and others that we'll discuss later on. So what are the differences between a classical and a quantum computer? Well, classical computers calculate information in classical processors that employ error correction and do not lose information to interactions with the environment or when the processor is measured. These processors are small and can be found in your computer or cell phone and contain over a billion transistors in a CPU. Quantum information is fragile and, and can be lost to the environment through a process called decoherence, where particles that are not part of the quantum computer interact with the information, taking it out of that superposition I was discussing earlier. Quantum computers contain qubits, and they're large devices that haven't really been commercialized and require significant equipment. Further, quantum computers have nascent error correction technologies. And quantum computing platforms have at most over 100 qubits, so a couple hundred, the quantum equivalent of a classical bit. And classical computers have well-defined established memory technologies. However, on the other hand, quantum computers have nascent memory technologies that may include atom or light-based systems. And, and 
Cloning the information memory is challenging because of the no cloning theorem I mentioned earlier, which makes it to where unknown quantum states cannot be copied. So let's talk a little about these qubits that I mentioned on the previous slide. So qubits are atoms, molecules, photons, artificial structures, or other things. And they are described for today's quantum computers as physical qubits. And these physical qubits are at various stages of development with some technologies being just in that proposed very early day stage, while others are a part of quantum computing platforms that may have up to a few hundred noisy qubits and may be available for use by the general public. And at the end of the day, it's not yet known what qubit will end up powering a future full-scale quantum computing platform. So these qubits can be divided into categories which are either naturally occurring or artificial structured qubits. So technologies such as trapped ion, neutral atom, or photonic or light qubits are naturally occurring physical qubits. These systems vary by their number of available qubits with photonic qubit quantum computing platforms containing up to a few hundred physical qubits and being available for use by the general public over the cloud. While systems such as trapped ion qubit quantum computing platforms and neutral atom systems may have up to dozens of noisy qubits and may be available for, general, for use by the general public over the cloud. Superconducting quantum dot and topological qubits are examples of artificial structures that are used as qubits. And superconducting qubit quantum computing platforms have platforms with systems of up to over 100 qubits available for use by the general public. And quantum dot qubits have quantum computing platforms with up to a few noisy qubits that have been demonstrated. And these systems are of interest because they could operate in a similar manner to a transistor. Topological qubits have not yet been demonstrated, so really in that very early days that I discussed on the previous slide, but are theorized to be possible and are of interest because of their potential for error correction. You'll notice that I haven't talked about color centers on this slide, and that's because some qubits like color centers are difficult to characterize as natural or artificial physical qubits. And color centers operate as defects in crystal structures such as those in diamonds and systems with a few dozen noisy qubits have been demonstrated. So now that we've talked about some about the qubits, what about the quantum computer itself? Well, the quantum computer itself requires significant classical hardware. Basically everything above the dotted line on this slide is a classical technology that would be used in a quantum computer. While the quantum physics or the quantum computer portion of the quantum computer is really a very small portion of the computer itself. And it contains things, and in addition to containing the qubits, it contains things like the isolating equipment that prevent those qubits from interacting with the outside world. So in the classical portion of the quantum computer, there is, going, there is a host classical computer that provides the user with access to the quantum computer. And that takes the instructions and the algorithms and the programs that the user would give to the quantum computer and submits those to the classical computer processors that are controlling the quantum computer. And that then takes that information and changes it into instructions for the control and measurement equipment. So the control and measurement equipment itself then converts these signals that it receives from the classical computer processors controlling the quantum computer into signals that are needed to operate the quantum computer, which can be things like laser or microwave pulses. And then that information is sent as control signals to that qubit and isolating equipment. The, which is the quantum mechanical portion of the quantum computer. And so the qubits and isolating equipment then send readout signals back to the control and measurement equipment, which then gives that back as measurements back to the classical computer processors controlling the quantum computer, which then provides the results to the user at the host classical computer. So in addition to their hardware, quantum computers will require, as similar to classical computers, will require extensive software. And early software has been developed to support available early noisy quantum computing platforms. And these platforms may be especially sensitive to their software quality. 
Because of this, code may be optimized and compiled for each task that the noisy intermediate quantum computer undertakes. And this is because of resource constraints. As quantum computers develop, it will be important to concurrently develop their hardware and software. And at this point, I just want to stress that quantum computers are available for use through the cloud by the general public. And various companies have these computers available for use, and the national labs have developed chest beds. However, these platforms are in their early days and are generally not available for purchase by the public. So now that we've discussed a little about the quantum computer, what types of quantum computers are available? Well, there are two types of quantum computers that are available for use by the general public, analog and gate-based quantum computers. And analog quantum computing machines prepare an initial set of qubits that represent all possible solutions to a problem and exploit quantum properties to identify a solution. And you'll notice for this, I've shown a little graphic with some mountains. And this is because the solution can be thought of as snow at the top of a mountain. And as the snow melts, the water flows down the mountain and pools in the optimal solution. So the other type of technology that's available is gate-based quantum computing platforms. And these are commonly referred to right now as noisy intermediate scale quantum computers and they break down information to, into a series of basic operations or gates. And these systems operate in a similar manner to a quantum, classical computer's logic gates. So first I'll talk a little bit more about a specific form of analog quantum computing called the quantum annealing machine. And the quantum annealing machine is designed to solve certain optimization problems, such as the traveling salesman problems related to transportation routes, traffic flows, and drug design. And they can solve certain problems such as certain that are impractical to solve on a classical computer. And this is because for the traveling salesman problem, the bigger the traveling salesman problem is on a classical computer, the harder it is for a classical computer to solve it. So this is something that a quantum computer can do much more easily. And so now a little bit more about gate-based quantum computers. So today's and their current iteration, gate-based quantum computers are described as noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And they are noisy because they contain nascent air correction technology and of intermediate scale because they contain 50 to hundreds of qubits. Because of their size and air correction capabilities, they have limited computational resources and can solve only certain computational problems that are of interest at this point really to the people who are developing the quantum computers and academic researchers and the like. So what needs to happen to develop a future, to develop today's quantum computing platforms into future full-scale quantum computing platforms that can do things that might be of interest to the defense or other industries? Well, work is needed to develop quantum computer air correction along with hardware and software. In the future, some quantum computers may use air correction methods such as logical qubits. And a logical qubit will combine a few hundred to more than 15,000 physical qubits, depending on the qubit quality, into one logical qubit. And doing so could create versatile and air-free quantum computers. Full-scale quantum computers themselves will require over 1 million physical qubits, and as such will require significant hardware development. Extensive software development will also be needed. So quantum computers themselves are going to go through many iterations from where they are today to get to these full-scale quantum computing platforms. So what might this look like? Well, estimates of the time and cost to develop a prototype full-scale quantum computer are uncertain and range widely. Today's quantum computers are noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, as I mentioned, and not suitable for solving problems of interest outside of computer development and research circles. In the next three to five years, the quantum computers that are going to be developed are likely going to be larger noisy intermediate scale quantum computing devices with decreasing noise and increasing air correction. And the next step after that would be something that is referred to as a fault tolerant quantum computer. And there's really some uncertainty as to when fault tolerant quantum computers will be developed. 
Some researchers have indicated that such devices could be developed within the next few years, while others have indicated that larger noisy intermediate scale quantum computing devices could be built for the next five to 10 years. So what about that full scale quantum computer? Well, it will take at least a decade and cost at least a billion dollars to devote, develop a prototype full scale quantum computer, according to some that we spoke to. And others that we spoke to said this work could take decades and cost billions. And still others could not provide estimates of the time or cost required to build a full-scale quantum computer. So what needs to be done to get us there? And what has been done? Well, companies, agencies, and stakeholder groups have developed roadmaps that outline technology development activities. And these activities can include the timeframes, costs, high-level steps, or even needed personnel estimates to develop these machines. And there are several types of research and development efforts that are going to be needed, including making improvements to existing technologies. Research could lead to more uniform qubits and better isolated qubits, along with increased coherence time, which would allow for longer, more in-depth calculations. Since quantum computing platforms themselves require classical technologies, Work will also need to be done to better integrate quantum and classical technologies. And additional hardware development will be needed as full-scale quantum computers will require at least 1 million physical qubits as compared to the 50-ish to 200 physical qubit machines now, so a few orders of magnitude bigger. And this is going to require new equipment to hold the qubits. And quantum foundries will also need to be improved as these foundries that are currently in existence do not produce qubits at a level expected for industrial research and development systems. Software will also require additional research. So now that we have a little background on quantum computing, what can, they, what can these computers do? Well, current quantum computers are of interest to limited audiences like quantum computing research researchers and academic research groups. These machines have been used for proof of concept benchmarking and demonstration calculation. And these systems require additional physical, physical qubits in order to be of broader interest to those such as the defense sector. It is unclear if quantum computers will be useful until they have at least 100,000 qubits, if not a million. And these qubits will need to be air corrected. So an advanced quantum computer could have applications in many sectors that are of interest to defense. So starting with a little bit more about today's classical computers. So today's classical computers are, except for limited demonstration problems, more powerful than today's, today's quantum computers. And this is really true and except for a few limited cases. And these are de demonstration problems that have been designed to demonstrate a quantum advantage. So future quantum computers may have applications in areas of interest, such as machine learning and optimization, chemistry and material science, and cryptography. So to begin with machine learning and optimization, these are really the first applications that could be of interest to uh, at quantum computer, to people working with quantum computers, as these will require the fewest qubits. So these systems may help to solve problems and could be of interest to companies with supply chain, delivery, and other optimization type problems. And quantum computers themselves may solve one aspect or part of a machine learning or optimization problem and may do so in tandem with classical computers. Optimization problems are also useful for benchmarking quantum computers. So quantum computing companies can see, can use these computers to see how well, and these problems to see how well their machines are doing. However, it is unclear if a thousand qubit quantum computer will outperform a classical computer for these applications, or if they will be able to economically outperform them. The next applications a uh, quantum computer may be useful for may be chemistry simulations. And such simulations could be important across many industries, including defense, and have applications in areas such as energy, pharmaceuticals, and aerospace engineering. These computers will likely need to contain at least 100,000 physical qubits. But the question is how big these computers will need to be in order to be useful. 
Because quantum computers themselves are based on quantum physics properties, they follow the same rules that chemicals do on the atomic and molecular level. As such, quantum computers could, efficient, could efficiently solve quantum chemistry problems. Because of this, it is easier for quantum computers to solve chemistry problems than classical computers. Classical computers have to make significant approximations in order to solve such problems, and quantum computers won't have to make these same approximations. One example of this difficulty is on a classical, com on a classical computer is simulations of four chromium atoms. This simulation required over 8,000 classical processors and took over 100 days to provide a classical approximation solution. So a long time and a lot of computational power. Today's quantum computers with less than 100 physical qubits have solved calculations for hydrogen, nitrogen, and diamond lattice structure. While these problems can be easily approximated on a classical computer, they are important to run on quantum computers for benchmarking reasons. Further, future quantum computers could further perform calculations that are not possible on classical computers, resulting in knowledge that could lead to improved technologies. And one example of this is better understanding the iron molybdenum cofactor. And this molecule is important for ammonia production, which could lead to better fertilizer production techniques because the process we use right now has been around since the late 1800s and is not that efficient. Such calculations will, could, could be completed in a much shorter time frame than would be required on a classical computer if the classical computer could run the calculation at all. Ultimately, quantum computers may be able to simulate chemistry experiments and help companies to avoid costs associated with physical experiments, which are costly and time consuming. So this slide shows a toy molecule here. And for these simulations, it's also possible that a quantum computer may only simulate a, a small handful of bonds with high accuracy, while a classical computer could simulate the rest. Even with providing a potential advantage for chemistry simulations, quantum computers will remain specialized and may only have a limited number of tasks for which they present an advantage for. They are likely to supplement rather than supplant classical computers. Along these lines, we are very unlikely to see word processing software for quantum computers or other such programs in the future. So the next area of application could be quantum encryption. So advanced quantum computers can break some, but not all forms of encryptions. An encryption technology such as the RSA algorithm may be susceptible to quantum attack. However, such attacks will likely require quantum computers with more than one, one million physical qubits. So these are these big full-scale quantum computers that likely aren't going to be built for at least the next 10 years. Over the last few years, NIST, in preparation for this, has maintained a program to develop post-quantum cryptography standards. This program is currently in its candidates to be standardized phase and has three digital signature candidates and one public key encryption candidate. It should be noted that one of the algorithms that was ultimately not selected for the final round but made it pretty far into the selection process was trivially hacked a little earlier this year. So there are also some additional possibilities for advanced quantum computing that require advancements in both quantum computing and communications technologies. And these applications couple quantum computers with other quantum information science applications. For example, blind quantum computing could allow remote user to connect to a quantum computer using a quantum network. The user could then run a calculation on the quantum computer. And while the quantum computer's owner could see that someone had used the quantum computer, they would not know what the quantum computer was used for. And this would require a non-trivial interface between the quantum computer's qubits and the qubits used within the quantum network. Further, a very advanced quantum communications and computing network could be a part of a quantum internet and could let people connect quantum computers across the globe. It should be noted for both of these applications that quantum does not necessarily mean fast. Quantum communications networks or the quantum internet may be slower than the classical internet as information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. 
So another topic that we examined is policy options that could help address factors that could impact quantum computing development. And it's important to note that when we talk about policy options, policy options are directed to policymakers at large, which can include those in academic, NGOs, and others in addition to those in local, state, and federal governments. So we identified four policy option areas where policymakers could explore policy options to help address factors that can impact quantum computing development. And these include supply chain, collaboration, workforce development, and quantum technology investment. So starting with supply chain, the quantum computing supply chain is global and highly specialized. And as we've learned over the past few years, Global supply chains may pose risks. It can be difficult to obtain a complete understanding of the component's potential vulnerabilities within a global supply chain. Some critical components, such as rare earths, are mined primarily outside of the United States, which may pose supply chain risks that are difficult to mitigate. Components for quantum computers are also often built in specific locations or countries and developing manufacturing facilities can be costly and time consuming. To address this, policymakers could consider enhancing efforts to identify gaps in the global supply chain or expand fabrication facilities for items with an at-risk supply chain. The second policy option we explored relates to collaboration. And policymakers could encourage further collaboration in developing quantum technologies, such as collaboration among different scientific disciplines, sectors, and countries. Institutional differences can make collaboration difficult and intellectual property concerns can make quantum technology leaders reluctant to collaborate. Export controls may further complicate international collaboration, but there is also a need to manage sec national security risks. The third policy option we explored relates to workforce development. And for workforce development, policymakers could consider ways to expand the quantum technology workforce, such as through leveraging existing programs, creating new programs, promoting job training, and facilitating international hiring. And efforts to increase the quantum technology labor force may affect the supply of expertise for other high demand technology fields. Additionally, it may be difficult to adequately develop workforce plans to accommodate quantum technology needs. And international hiring may be challenging because of visa requirements and export controls, both of which are in place for national security reasons. So the last policy option that we looked at relates to quantum technology investment. Specifically, policymakers could consider ways to incentivize or support quantum technology development investment. And this could be happen such as through targeted investments, continued investments in quantum technology research centers, or other things. However, it may be difficult to fund projects with longer term time, project timeframes based on how projects tend to be funded within the United States. And a lack of standards may cause businesses and customers to not be confident that products will work as expected. However, if standards are developed too early, it may deter the growth of alternative technology pathways, which are needed to advance technologies. So the last area we'll discuss today is industry and federal players. So there are many companies that are involved with quantum computing, and these include companies that provide hardware, software, and other services such as education and consulting. And these companies can include big name companies like IBM, Amazon, and Google, and others that are more specific to quantum computing like Rigetti, D-Wave, Xanadu, or IonQ. There are also federal agencies involved in quantum computing efforts. And then these include agencies such as the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and some of its national labs, including labs like Argonne, Sandia, Oak Ridge, and Brookhaven. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, National Institute of Standards and Technology, National Science Foundation, and National Security Agency also have quantum computing efforts. There are also, there are, so there are many ongoing federal activities in quantum computing. I've just listed a few here. For example, as we discussed earlier, 
NIST has a post-quantum cryptography program described, designed to develop standards for post-quantum cryptography. It is currently in its fourth round and has developed a list of candidates to be standardized. According to its website, DARPA has an ongoing benchmarking program that's designed to estimate the long-term utility of quantum computers by creating new benchmarks that, quantitative measure, that quantitatively measure progress towards specific computational challenges and will in parallel estimate hardware-specific resources. The NDAA has had multiple quantum specific provisions over the years, including provisions to coordinate DOD quantum information science research, request for creating quantum information science workforce development plans, and in the 2022 NDAA included a provision to accelerate quantum technology development. So the National Quantum Initiative Act, while not quantum, while not defense specific, established a whole government approach to quantum information science. As a part of this, it established a 10-year na national quantum, quantum initiative program to accelerate the development of quantum information science, science and technology applications, invest in workforce development, and improve federal quantum information science coordination, among other things. And this was really between the Department of Energy, NIST, and NSF. And more recently, the Chips and Science Act included provisions that further increased coordination and included quantum information science as a key focus area for NSF's Directorate for Technology and Innovation Partnerships. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention and look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thanks, Dr. Hinkle, for that great and informative presentation. We have a whole bunch of questions. And remember, you can type in your questions in the question box on the side of your screen, and we'll try to get through as many as we can here. Um, the first one I'll go with is, uh, in looking at the international community and how many people are working in this space, how is the U.S. doing relative to competitors, particularly Russia and China, in, in advancing quantum computing? So it depends. In quantum computing, the United States tends to be ahead. However, there are efforts that are ongoing in China, particularly related to more of the photonic side of things that are very advanced. So it, it really depends on the technology, but for the most part, I would say for quantum computing, the US is ahead. Um, one question here is, would it be possible to do integrations of multiple small quantum computers, maybe a few thousand or less qubits, and then control them all in, with some central computer, some central processor. And that might be a way to, 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 to unleash or to uh, deploy a, an early commercial capability, kind of like GPUs and classical computers. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, so basically, if I'm understanding the question correctly, basically figuring out how to network and group a whole bunch of smaller quantum, quantum computers together into one bigger quantum computer. Um, that could be possible. However, it would require advances in quantum networking because there would be need to be ways to connect the quantum computer together. And quantum networking right now has some challenges, especially related to quantum memory and the like. So it's something that could be possible in the future. But like, like the rest of quantum computing itself, further development is required. There's a couple of questions on trying to get some clarification on the idea of noisy qubits. Is there a way for you to talk about you know, where that noise comes from? And is there any, any uh, analogy to what we see in our current classical computers, our phones or our laptops or anything like that? Okay, so for, for classical computers, your classical computer has air correction software itself that usually goes through and can tell if a bit needs to be a zero and it's, it's a one or vice versa. So classical computers have a very set way that they can go through and correct for errors. However, for quantum computers, because of the laws of quantum physics, those same properties, those same technologies aren't available. So the noise in a quantum computer itself can actually come from the outside world. Particles that are going through the air can interact with those qubits and actually cause noise because they'll take a qubit out of that superposition that it was in before. 
So some of it's going to be properly shielding the qubits from the environment, which is trickier than we thought because very small particles can actually cause a lot of damage from a quantum computing standpoint. So it's, it's progress made, work remains to solving this problem. And for the error correction itself, it's tricky because of things like the no cloning theorem. So since we can't copy unknown quantum states, it becomes much more tricky to solve. Does there's a set of questions. Oh yeah, I, I, I mean, um, there's a set of questions on how the average consumer in their daily lives will be affected by the advances in quantum computing. Is it something at one end where I will eventually buy one at Best Buy and put it in my house or is it affect my life in a different way? Um, I would, so we, we did hear some in our research about future desktop quantum computers. And if those happen at all, those are likely to be very, very, very far distant futures. So not something that would impact today's consumer at all. I would say the way that a quantum computer could have the most impact on today's consumers is through its ability to break certain forms of encryption. So there's going to need be, and those forms of encryption like RSA are used to keep our data safe over the internet. So there's going to be a need to move to different forms of encryption that can protect our data and make it to where actors can't hack that data. Following up on that encryption um, discussion there, we've heard and you talked about the potential that quantum computers could break our encryption in the ways we do it today. Can they actually help contribute to improving encryption as well? That is a good question. And I should mention that it's not all encryption. Certain, certain forms of encryption are not susceptible to quantum attack. So I think that programs like MIST programs are, MIST programs are working to improve that encryption. And from, from a quantum information science standpoint, there are certain quantum networking technologies that would protect data and potentially strengthen encryption, but there's work needs to be done to, um, to improve those technologies as well. There's a few questions on workforce issues. So we'll, we'll start with what are the challenges in, that we're facing right now in having the workforce that will build these kinds of quantum computers? Did you find that, that we're, we're facing a shortfall of certain particular skill sets? So something that we heard about a lot was quantum engineers. So we, we have various groups and academic research groups that have been working to develop quantum computers. However, there are a lot of physics people so there's gonna be a need to really create interdisciplinary fields that involve things like physics and engineering and put those two together to create the quantum engineers of the future that are gonna be needed to develop and further advance quantum technologies. And I would say generally there's a shortfall. And one thing we heard about not only was training new people but retraining existing people to work with quantum technologies. So these may be people who have done classical computer programming that could learn quantum computer programming or otherwise advance, expand their skills to work within the quantum computing world. So we need more quantum mechanics is what you're saying. We'll have to, we'll have to train them, develop them over time. Now, on the other hand, once these computers are developed, do you need special skills to use them? Or could we just take our current software coders, our consumers who use you know, their laptops, will they be able to make use of this technology? So quantum computers right now are available for use over the web and there are various programs. For example, IBM has its quantum experience where you can go in and you can actually, as a consumer, learn how to program a quantum computer and run programs on a quantum computer. So some of that is available now. Could you talk a little bit more about the non-workforce supply chain issues? Um, you know, are these going to be different than what we're seeing in classical computing and microelectronics, or are there particular new supply chain concerns that we'll have? 
Some of it will depend on the quantum computer itself. We do have some of the same issues for quantum computers that are for classical computers because quantum computers rely so heavily on quantum computing technologies. However, as these new technologies develop, depending on the type of quantum computer, there might be new supply chain problems that pop up. For example, in the cryogenics equipment that are used to see, keep certain types of quantum computers cool. But other types of quantum computers may not have those issues, and there may be more concerns related to the lasers that control their qubits and where those lasers are developed. So it'll really depend on the type of quantum computer as to what the specific supply chain concerns are. Okay, I'm sorting through these questions here. Um, if you showed some images, but if I was going to walk into a room and look at a quantum computer today, what kind of room would I be in and what kind of machine would I be looking at right now? You'd be in a very big room. And depending on the quantum computer, the technology would actually be different. So for some of the quantum computers, and I may just see if I can back up in my slides some here. Um, for some of the quantum computers, you'd be looking at things that are on like a laser table. So I'm waiting for the audience to be able to view this here. So this top image here on this slide shows a laser table and that's a quantum computer itself. So for some of them, it would look more like that. And for others, going back a little further in the presentation, those are what quantum, those are what quantum computers look like. So basically big tubes hanging down that, um, that are in a room with other things. So quantum computers look different depending on the type of technology that's being used. Um, is there anything that a quantum computer has done so far that couldn't have been done with a classical supercomputer? It depends. There are various, Toy problems that have demonstrated a quantum computing advantage. However, in the scientific literature, companies will announce that they've demonstrated this quantum computing advantage. And then someone a few months later will say, look, I've done that thing that you just demonstrated on a classical computer. So it, it really depends. There's nothing I would say definitive that a quantum computer has done better at this point, but people continue, people in research groups continue to put forward various um, various demonstration problems that they've done that are designed to show that quantum computing advantage. And we'll do one more. Um, is there any real argument about investing more in supercomputing, traditional supercomputing versus quantum computing? How are policymakers thinking about in a zero sum world, the balance between improving supercomputing as opposed to investing more in quantum computing? Oh, I think Arun, I'm going to leave that one for the policymakers themselves. Uh, <laughs> that's a fantastic question. All right, with that dodge, then I will thank you for to all the attendees for joining us today and the great questions. We're going to post the recording on NDI Connect as soon as uh, as soon as possible. If you have feedback about Tech Thursday series, uh, especially topics you want to see us cover in the future, um, please email us at eti at ndia.org. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity to highlight some upcoming events in our Tech 101 series. Uh, next Wednesday, this Wednesday, we're actually going to have a podcast with uh, Charlotte's boss, I believe, Tim Persons, who runs the science technology assessment and analytics team at, at GAO. Uh, and so Mark Lewis and him are on our podcast on Wednesday. Uh, we have future 101s, uh, advanced manufacturing 101s with John Barnes is October 6th, nuclear weapons technology 101 on October 20th with Dr. Bruce Goodwin from Lawrence Livermore and cloud 101 on November 3rd uh, with Matt Vukovic from CMU Software Engineering Institute. Registration information uh, is on our website and or feel free to reach out to ETI and, and we can help you. Again, thank you, Charlotte, and thank you everyone for attending. And with that, I'll close the session. Thank you.